So again, tonight, uh, my name is Joe Deli Carpini. I'm the Science and Operations Officer for the National Weather Service in Boston, which is in Norton, Mass. And along with me is Bryce Williams, one of our meteorologists who also manages our social media program. Good evening. You can say hello, Bryce. Sounds good. <laughs> All right, so this is Memorable Southern New England Storms, uh, part two, looking at storms from the 1970s through the 1990s. I'm sure many of you will remember these. And uh, again, put your, uh, if you have any memories of these storms or you have questions, go ahead and throw them in the chat box, which is on your control panel. And Bryce will be monitoring these during the webinar. We'll answer them as we go along. So we're going to start off um, like we did last time. We're going to go right through the calendar um, and just hit events as they've they come up. So our first one here is uh, Blizzard of 96. I'm sure many of you remember this one. Um, this was during the record setting winter of 1995-96, which held the record until 2014 and 2015. Um, this was probably the, one of the more famous uh, storms, widespread storms certainly, that occurred that winter from January 6th through January 9th. And you can see uh, you know, widespread swath of heavy snow from, the, uh, from Virginia up into New England, uh, including the major cities up along I-95. Uh, snowfall totals in our area to about almost two feet in Providence at TF Green. Um, 18 and a half at Blue Hill, 18 in, at Logan and Boston, and 16 over in Hartford at Bradley. Uh, this really uh, paralyzed the region for, for several days. Uh, as you can see on, on the impacts, transportation was halted, uh, airport closures, schools were closed for several days, and um, even a number of roof collapses following the storm. So um, this again, from the 1995-1996 winter, this was one of the more prolific storms that we had uh, during that winter. Anything, uh, any comments on there, Bryce? None so far. Okay. And, you know, if you want to throw in some later, go right ahead. So now going to 1998, um, this was uh, probably one of the worst ice storms, I think, you know, in in recent history that, that really affected all of New England. Um, it was certainly one of the most destructive ice storms on record, um, affecting the area primarily from northern New England um, and northern New York into southeast Canada, um, our portion of Massachusetts, Rhode Island, Connecticut were impacted, but not to the degree uh, as to, you know, areas to our north. Um, this was a fairly long duration ice storm um, and, you know, more than three inches of ice accumulation damage at about $3 billion. Uh, millions of customers had power, uh, lost power for, for weeks and uh, millions of acres of trees were damaged. And in fact, the, uh, the forecast office in uh, Gray, Maine, which is the Portland area, uh, we, our office in, in Boston, Taunton at the time, had to provide service backup for a couple of weeks uh, because they didn't have power and when they, where they were unable to uh, continue their operations. So uh, that's the New England ice storm of 1998. All right, so let's go on to the, the, the big winter, 1978. Um, this January 19 to 21, it wasn't the blizzard of 78, but... Um, this was the last in a series of, of three storms that uh, actually brought one to two feet of snow to much of southern New England. So um, it was the, the succession of the snow and sleet and even some rainstorms um, caused a, a number of roofs to cave in, including the Hartford Civic Center. Um, from this particular storm, Boston actually broke its all-time record 24-hour snowfall, but only to have it broken again two weeks later when the blizzard of 78 hit. And you can see some of the snowfall totals there. Uh, 21 inches in Boston, 19 at Blue Hill, 15 and a half Hartford, uh, little, just over 15 in Worcester, and uh, about 11 inches in Providence. So this is a fairly widespread storm, as you can see. Um, areas shaded here in blue, um, over 10 inches, pretty much 10 to 20 inches of snow with some pockets of higher amounts. So um, not the blizzard of 78, but this was kind of the, the precursor to that. So this was actually uh, from the Boston Globe on January 21st, 1978, snowbound. Um, and this storm actually wasn't forecast all that well. Um, and that helped set the stage for the what happened with the blizzard of 78 two weeks later. A lot of people just really didn't believe it was coming. Uh, so they really didn't pay attention to the forecast. And as we all know, yeah, it came along. So um, this was the first the storm about two weeks, again, before the blizzard of 78. January uh, 21st. Any questions or comments on that, Bryce? Nope. Oh, somebody, actually one just came in. Um, said the, uh, somebody, well, it, more of a comment it looks like. It looks, they said the uh, forecast for the 
Um, 78 was for more of an inside runner, i.e. mostly rain along the coast. Yeah, that's, that, yes, it was actually good. And that's a good comment. Thank you. Uh, yeah, it was for really a rain, you know, rain, I believe rain to snow, but it was mostly supposed to be rain. And uh, yeah, that didn't happen. So, <laughs> and that's what really, again, set the stage for uh, people really not believing, uh, you know, the blizzard of 78 forecast a couple of weeks later. All right, so let's go on to the blizzard of 78. Uh, this is probably, you know, this is really the benchmark of all winter storms uh, here in southern New England. Um, it's still, you know, to me, it's the granddaddy of them all. Um, this was uh, developed off the mid-Atlantic coast, and um, it just stalled offshore. And that was why we had such uh, heavy amounts of snow and high winds, um, and also devastating coastal flooding over four high tide cycles. So um, the region was really brought to a standstill for over a week, I'm sure. Um, some of you remember that. Um, you can see the, really the maximum corridor of snowfall. It might be hard to see on this map here, but over really over three feet of snow um, in northwest Rhode Island into the southwest suburbs of Boston. So um, that came, it came in, you know, midday. Uh, most people had gone to work, gone to school, and, you know, not really believing the forecast. And then um, it came in like a wall, essentially a wall of snow with uh, heavy snowfall rates, thunder and lightning, and that lasted all through the night. That was the blizzard of 78. Um, what you see here, we actually dug up a couple of the observation forms. Um, the one on the left is the observation form from Logan Airport. Um, it's all in code, but essentially um, you had, you know, moderate to heavy snow for, for most of the, obviously most of the day, most of the night. Um, wind gusts, uh, you can see the little G here. These are the wind gusts in knots, so you'd have to convert that to miles per hour, but um, you know, heavy, heavy snow. The problem with the measurements for this storm, uh, with the fact that it was essentially blowing sideways, obviously, very, very difficult to measure. Now you can see in the comments here, you see um, SNOINCR, snow increase, and that's your, what they're reporting is the snow falling per hour. So it's this first number here, one, you see a lot of one, and then the last number is what's on the ground. It was so difficult to measure, uh, the observer had, was pretty much estimating an inch per hour, which, you know, going back over the data now, we think that was most likely underdone. Um, it you know, easily could have been snowfall rates of three to four inches per hour. So the snowfall total at Logan, I believe, was 27.1 inches from the storm. It was likely higher. Um, I would say, you know, maybe somewhere in, in the 35 inch range, maybe even a little bit higher than that. But you know, again, uh, having been an observer myself, I know this is extremely difficult to measure uh, during the storm. And the same held true actually at TF Green. Uh, they had a very difficult time measuring. It was probably undermeasured as well. The actual total was probably a little bit higher than that. And then on the right, um, this is a the observation form from a cooperative observer in Norton, actually uh, Ed, who uh, recently retired from the National Weather Service. And uh, this was his form that day. And you can see um, he had a total of about 39 inches between the two days from the blizzard of 78. So uh, it was kind of a neat historical piece that we picked up uh, at the office. That is pretty cool. I've yeah. never seen that. And, you know, I think many people have seen, uh, the, you know, obviously these famous photos, uh, Route 128 outside of Boston. This is in uh, Canton heading up the hill. Uh, cars just stopped in their tracks. Um, in Providence, people lining up for a bus ride as, you know, as the storm begins to hit. Uh, and I think we have a couple of more here. These are from Providence. Um, cars essentially stopped in their tracks on 195. And um, also, you know, the scene on uh, I-95 in Rhode Island, the same situation. Um, cars just stopped in their tracks. Many people had to spend the night um, in their vehicles. So, uh, Bryce, any comments on this one? A couple of comments, at least. Um, I can only see one at a time, so we'll go through here. Sure. Somebody just, just mentioned, um, just someone said I was 16 during the blizzard of 78 and still remember the rare thunder snow with blue lightning. So that's interesting. Yeah, and that's actually pretty common in winter storms. You see a bluish yep. tint. Yep. All right. Um, somebody says, I remember Governor Garrity and meteorologist John Gorsi. Gorsi. Yeah. Yep. That's in Rhode Island. Yep. So I've been on Providence. Oh, okay. Yep. Somebody said I live with my family in Providence and we couldn't get heating oil deliveries. So I had to dress in layers while conserving heat. Yikes. Oh boy. Yeah. I imagine, uh, you know, and that um, must have been, and it got cold afterwards too. It wasn't, you know, a nice warm day when this was done. Yeah. So yeah. yeah. 
Shortage Somebody said the, L, the LMS, parentheses, long since retired, was the outlier that first pegged two, um, two to, uh, I'm not sure what it says. But oh, I'm I not sure. they're I'm, talking I'm about the computer model, which back then was one of them was called the LFM. And oh, that okay. actually did forecast the storm uh, reasonably well. Yeah, that's what it's well. saying, 84 hours out. Yeah. yeah. I had it. I mean, and uh, when we do our top ten, obviously we'll include this storm, and we'll we'll get a, we'll get some of that forecast information for everybody too, so you can see. But yeah, actually, um, this forecast wasn't terrible. It's just people didn't necessarily believe it after the storm two weeks before. So, mm. Somebody yeah. said, "Where was the rain snow line for the blizzard of '78?" Ooh, I have to you look that. that. Yeah, on top of your head, it's kind of tough. Top of my head, I don't know. Um, I thought maybe near the islands, but I'd have to look that up. That's something we'll add to the the top 10 version. Yeah. I think I'll look at that. Somebody said, somebody said, from what I recall, there were three systems that merged off the coast and it bombed and stalled, maybe a very strong high pressure in the Canadian Maritimes. Yeah, there was actually a bit of a what's called a block in the atmosphere. So there was high pressure to the north and it just caused the storm to sit and spin right off the coast. Uh, ah. And that just kept, you know, it was deepening. It was getting a lot of energy from the jet stream also. Uh, from the warm waters of the Gulf Stream. So everything just came together. Um, you know, we can call that one of our perfect storms, I think, for the winter. Yeah. So. Jonathan said rain snow line to the canal. Okay. And yeah, the, that makes sense. The Cape Cod Canal is where, where the line. There you go. Up. Thank <laughs> you. Thank you for that comment. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Jonathan. All right. So just a couple more things on the Blizzard of 78. This is the, uh, the coastal flooding aspect. Um, and just, you know, devastating uh, damage, you know, houses completely uh, damaged in situate. Uh, that's one of the more uh, vulnerable spots. Um, you can see on the left, Revere, um, houses just took a beating from this over, again, multiple tide cycles. So it wasn't just like one high tide cycle and they were done. Uh, it was just complete devastation. This is probably the one of the most devastating coastal flood events that we've had here um, in, you know, essentially modern history. So some blizzard bits, I got this from a presentation we had at the office, and this talks a little bit about the forecast. Um, it was actually remark forecast remarkably well, um, you know, several days in advance. There was a winter storm watch issued uh, about 30 hours ahead, a heavy snow watch issued on su Sunday afternoon before, um, and then warnings were issued early Monday morning with um, the mention of near blizzard conditions 15 hours in advance. So. Um, again, many people were stranded because of the onset occurred slightly later than predicted. It was around midday, um, and people were skeptical following the, the um, inaccurate forecasts the preceding month. So, again, kind of a, just the worst-case scenario uh, for from an impact standpoint. Okay, so moving on, now we're into a little more into February, but uh, the 1995 a lot of people may not remember this storm, but it was the only uh, significant winter storm that affected the region during the winter of 94, 95. Um, it intensified track from the Maryland coast um, over to Plymouth. Uh, that track gives us the heaviest snow typically across the interior, and this was no exception. Um, there was the heaviest snow out in Western Mass into the Monadnox, Northern Worcester County. Um, coastal areas saw snow, but then with the track over southeast Massachusetts, that tends to draw a milder area, and so there was a change to rain. And you can see some of the snowfall totals there, six inches Boston, up to as much as 17 and a half in uh, West Townsend, Mass. So just talking about some of the historic nor'easters of the 20th century, I'm just going back. I guess this slide's out of order. Uh, the blizzard of 78 certainly, you know, is, is listed. Um, in the 90s, we also have the Halloween storm of 91, December nor'easter of 92, um, some pretty good stream flooding in October of 96, and of course the April Fool's Day storm of uh, April 1997, and we'll talk about all of these as we go forward. And some of these other storms listed earlier, we will talk in parts part three of our series. So in 1983, um, I certainly remember this one, uh, February 10th to 12th, this was the megalopolitan storm um, that really crushed uh, areas from Washington, D.C. up through New York and into Boston. Um, set all-time 24-hour sn snow records in Allentown, Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Um, and Allentown and Hartford had five inches of snow in one hour. So uh, this, was, this was a really big snow producer uh, throughout much of the Northeast. Uh, I was growing up in the New York City area at the time, and uh, remember we had, you know, obviously the day off from school, but it really came in like a wall, and temperature dropped into the teens and it was snowing 
um, easily, you know, two to four inches per hour, just uh, an incredible storm. So that's certainly one that I remember. Um, any comments on this one, Bryce? I mean, I mean, too many folks that remember this. Nope, nothing so far. Nothing yet, okay. Okay, so I think more people will remember this one, the Superstorm of 1993, March. Um, and this was one of the strongest non-tropical weather systems recorded in eastern U.S. weather history, believe it or not. Um, it produced damaging winds, heavy snow, and blizzard conditions even from Georgia and Alabama into western New England. Produced 15 tornadoes in Florida. Uh, luckily, the coastal flooding was averted along the south coast because of a wind shift early Sunday morning. Um, there was a lot of wind damage across the area, um, including part of a church steeple toppled in Chatham. And snow drifts were up to five feet across central and western Massachusetts. Um, you can see some of the snowfall totals there on the right. Um, Boston, over, just over a foot. Providence, 10. Hartford, about 15. And Worcester, 20. Um, now, this particular storm, Bryce, you will like this story. Uh, I was a new meteorologist of about two years working in Binghamton, New York, which is straight smack in the middle of the storm. And I showed up for work at 6 a.m. on Saturday, and I ended up leaving work at 2 p.m. on Sunday. Had to, got stuck there. Uh, we had over two feet of wow. snow, and um, it, it was snowing like crazy all night. There were three of us who ended up working, you know, through the whole event. Um, and, you know, it was – in those days, we took surface weather observations at the airport, and we had a radar and that. But other than that, it was just, you know, we were stuck there. <laughs> so it was wow. uh, it was certainly a, a fun storm to work. Um, and, you know, luckily, by the next afternoon, things were pretty much cleared out so I could go home. But um, somewhere my wife has a picture of me sleeping on the couch with the uh, newspaper showing the headline about the storm. So I'll have to dig that <laughs> awesome. for the office. But, yeah, that was, a, that was a pretty good storm in upstate New York um, over two It's funny you say that because um, I, I, so I don't remember this storm. Um, but I, so I was three years old at the time, but I was living <laughs> – so our house in – you see how far the snow stretches. Um, our house in East Tennessee – where I'm from, uh, we have pictures from that storm of we had, I think, six to seven inches on our back porch, which for us was a lot. Um, and people still talk about that storm back home in Tennessee. So it's funny because I always, even growing up before I even um, have, was anywhere close to working for the weather service, I remember seeing pictures of this storm in, in our back porch and always wishing we would get that much snow again. We never really did. <laughs> well, maybe we'll have to dig up some pictures for our top 10 because this will certainly make that. So there you go. Uh, any, uh, any comments from our folks on this one? Let's see. There's, there wasn't uh, somebody, well, somebody. Yep. Uh, somebody just, somebody give us a nice comment. Fred said, uh, this was forecasted five days out very well by the NWS. Okay. Yeah, this actually it was. Um, it hit on a uh, it hit on the Saturday, and I remember the Friday um, I was on the day shift, and we actually in New York State issued blizzard warnings on Friday afternoon, and it put off the EAS, and it never been done before. So there was wow. a, I mean, we never issued a blizzard warning more than you know six twelve hours ahead of time in those days, and this was you know more than twenty four hours. It was awesome. yeah, the, the the computer models really nailed this one. There was really good agreement. Um, so it was it was almost a slam dunk forecast, one of the very few that I probably had in my career. So good point. And yeah, somebody, somebody. Oh, go, no, go ahead. No, I was, go ahead. I was just going to say somebody pointed out March 93 coincident with the same date of the great 1888 blizzard. <laughs> so I don't know. I believe I, that's I, I, true. I'll take their yeah. word for it. Yeah. And we'll we will talk about that one in uh, part yeah. four of our yeah. series. Yep. That was also in March. OK. Moving on, now we're into 1982 in April. This was the Northeast blizzard of April 6th and 7th, late season uh, storm. Uh, this was low pressure coming from the Gulf Coast. Whenever you hear one coming out of the Gulf Coast, you know it has moisture with it, um, to the Ohio Valley and then redeveloped off the mid-Atlantic coast. Um, this was over a foot of snow across much of the region, uh, pretty much in that blue shading, um, and we had strong winds with blizzard conditions. You can see uh, snowfall totals well over a foot. Uh, in the big cities, and actually out in Plainfield, two feet. So a um, little bit of elevation always helps. Uh, but this storm put April 1982 as one of the top five snowiest Aprils on record uh, for the four major climate sites, as well as Blue Hill Observatory. So I believe that is still the case today. So April of 1982, that was a pretty good storm. And I, I want to say, growing up in New York, that uh, base, the baseball's opening day was canceled down there uh, from this storm as well. So okay. nothing like an early April snowstorm. 
And here's a here's a couple of uh, other images. So uh, this was from the Boston Globe. Um, spring gets snowed under. Um, April April's blizzard breaks a record. And uh, here's a picture of the map, uh, just showing there was redevelopment off the Mid Atlantic coast. And bingo, there we go. It draws in the cold air. And we get our snow. All right, now total opposite side of the coin. Let's talk about a heat wave. Uh, some of you may remember this because it coincided with the Boston Marathon, April 19th, 1976. Um, much of the Northeast was in the midst of an early season heat wave. Um, and the marathon took place in 90 plus degree heat along much of the route from Hopkinton to Boston. Um, although it was cooler in, in Boston, it reached 82 that day. Um, but you can see the four day stretch of, of high temperatures, um, you know, away from, from the, the ocean influence of Boston, Providence um, in the 90s, Hartford in the 90s. and and even Worcester, that's pretty impressive for early April. So I don't know if anybody remembers that day with the marathon, but um, picture from the Boston Globe there on the, on the lower right, hose the runners. <laughs> so an early season heat wave um, in 1976. Going back to snow, because we know everybody loves snow. Uh, April of 1987, this was a, a late April snowstorm. Um, High pressure was to our north, kept cold air supplied across the region, and uh, we had surface low pressure. I'm heading to the Gulf of Maine. Rain changed over to snow on the back side of the storm, um, 15 to 22 inches across northwest Rhode Island and central and northwest Mass into portions of uh, northern New England. Um, this was over 180,000 people lost power, uh, some for days, and um, hundreds of traffic accidents across the region, and uh, also several radio stations knocked off the air in New Hampshire and uh, both in, in Fitchburg, Mass as well. Um, and this storm, uh, you can see the totals there with Worcester of 17 inches, Boston of four, obviously less as you head further south. Um, it was second uh, placed April 1987 as the second snowiest April on record for Worcester. Um, and only behind April 1997, which was the um, April Fool's Day storm. So um, that dropped two feet. So this is a map looking at the amounts, um, you can see lesser amounts closer to the coast and obviously more uh, higher snowfall inland, especially where you have some elevation. Okay, how about into May? And last May we had some snow and uh, there was a lot of comparisons to this one. Um, this was May 9th to 10th of 1977. Um, and this is still the latest measurable snowfall recorded uh, in, in Boston, Hartford and Providence. Um, this was a pretty much unrelenting winter, 1976 to 77. Um, and there was a foot of heavy snow to you know, northern portions of the area, uh, four to six inches in like central mass and um, some of the lower elevation sections. Um, but extensive, uh, obviously tree and power line damage due to the fact that uh, trees had their leaves out and the snow weighed them down. Also, many boats were blown from their moorings, grounded or wrecked. Um, and this was the second time in weather records that measurable snow depth was recorded in Boston during May. Um, previously, it was May 8th of 1938. And you can see the totals here again, favoring elevation, um, half inch in Boston, eight inches in Blue Hill, uh, about 13 in Worcester and 18 out in Plainfield, Mass. And of course, thanks again to the Boston Globe. Uh, they call this spring. Yeah, <laughs> May 8th, 9th of 1977. Anyone? Uh, any comments on that one, Bryce? That's a pretty infamous uh, event. Somebody said the uh, National Guard cleared the streets of Newton five inches of snow. I believe it, because <laughs> I'm sure we were unprepared for that. Okay, now getting into, now we will see we start to get into a little more severe weather. Um, this was May 29th, 1995, one of the more significant uh, severe weather outbreaks in New England. Um, Great Barrington in particular, an F4 tornado touched down in the evening and tracked 11 and a half miles. Um, this was three people were unfortunately killed uh, when an automobile they were driving in was thrown several hundred feet through the air. Um, 24 people injured, mostly from flying glass. And there was also a second tornado in Southbury, Connecticut. Um, you can see the image here in the lower right, courtesy of our friend Ryan Hanrahan. Um, this was an F1 tornado, which uh, uprooted trees, snap trees, and uh, minor structural damage along a two mile path. So actually two tornadoes on that day, although certainly the Great Barrington tornado gets most of the uh, most of the headlines from that day. Then another one of the um, more notable severe weather outbreaks were May 31, 1998. 
uh, in the northeast. And um, you can see on the map here, um, blue indicates wind damage, green is hail, and red are tornadoes. Uh, this was one of the more, again, prolific severe weather outbreaks in the northeast. Um, some of the highlights here from southern New England, an F1 tornado in Connecticut. Um, Holy Cross College in Worcester reported a wind gust of 104 miles per hour, 94 miles per hour at Worcester Airport, and 61 miles per hour at Bradley in Windsor Locks. Um, golf ball hail in Pittsfield and Danbury, and nickel size hail in Lowell and Peabody. Um, and in fact, uh, Bryce, I don't think you know this, but on this particular day, we were hosting an open house at the Taunton office when we were located oh, wow. there. Uh, so <laughs> we were able to get people in and out, but then um, a lot of people hung around uh, through the afternoon when we went into severe weather mode. So uh, uh -huh. that was a lot of, be pretty cool for yeah, this. yeah. And that building, you know, it was, we had to kind of, the operations are roped off a little bit, but people could walk down the, you know, the, uh, the aisles a little bit and kind of just watch as things were going on. And, uh, that was the highlight of the day for the open house. That's, seriously. The <laughs> stay for the severe weather. Wow. So, yeah, that was, that was May 31st, 1998. Okay, June of uh, 1982, uh, one of the more notable flood events, uh, especially for Connecticut. Uh, this was June 4th to 7th. Um, this was low pressure moving up from the Gulf Coast. It stalled and um, just dumped a lot of rain across the region. We had up to 16 inches of rain in a four-day period. Um, the heaviest amounts, as you can see on the map across um, southern uh, Connecticut. Um, it set a, on Saturday, June 5th, about half the total fell, about 10 inches. Uh, it was already, you know, wet from previous rainfall, so um, flooding obviously was fairly widespread. And one of the ironies, uh, is, is listed here, was the, uh, the Northeast River Forecast Center um, had to be evacuated. And in those days, they were located in Bloomfield, Connecticut, in the Hartford area. And uh, they had to move to other locations um, in order to complete, complete their forecast responsibility. So nowadays, they're located with us in Norton, but uh, previously, they were in Bloomfield, Connecticut, and this affected their office. June 20th, 1995, one of the bigger hail events for Connecticut. Um, and this was a um, powerful thunderstorm uh, moved across the region. Baseball hail in several towns listed there, Vernon, Manchester, Old Saybrook, and Deep River. Um, actually, Deep River was the hardest hit town uh, where the hail lasted 20 minutes and um, some automobiles were, were totaled and some buildings damaged. You can see this is kind of a 3D cross section of the storm that produced the hail um, and just a very deep core um, in the middle here, you can see as it approaches Manchester. Um, the white region here, if you can kind of see it, is where the hail, the kind of the hail core is. That's a massive hail core uh, for a storm here in southern New England. So that was in June of 1995. Just jumping back real quick to the yeah. 95 tornado. Somebody sure. had a comment. Patricia said that she remembers um, the 1995 tornadoes. They lived in Holyoke, Mass at the time, and they sheltered in the basement for quite a while. The sky was super dark and it was a talk of the town for a few days. And then when they went back skiing in Great Barrington five to six years later, you could still see some of the damage pass from the lift. Oh, I believe it. Yeah. You know, not unlike uh, June of 2011, where the, the, the damage scars were still, you know, visible on satellite for yeah. years after that as well. Yeah. Prior yeah. to that, this was one of the bigger tornado days um, in Massachusetts. So thanks for sharing that. Appreciate it. All right. So we're moving on. Uh, June, uh, sorry, July of 1972. Uh, there were some tornadoes in Massachusetts, uh, two of them, in fact. Uh, one from Tingsboro to South Chelmsford. It was an F2 uh, with a path length of about seven and a half miles. And another one in Wakefield. This was a, a brief F1 touchdown um, with a path length of about a third of a mile uh, and no injuries. But still, you know, appreciable amount of damage uh, from Tingsboro to South Chelmsford in 1972. Kind of a little known, uh, probably little known mini outbreak here in Massachusetts. Okay, excessive heat. Uh, this was one of, we don't have a lot of hot or cold uh, events to show you, but this one I thought was, was pretty notable back in 1975, August 2nd. Um, record highs at all of the four climate sites. Um, all time record high of 104 degrees set for Providence and an all time record minimum high of 83 set in Boston. So um, you could see 100 degrees plus at all except Worcester, which is obviously elevated. So doesn't get quite as hot there, but um, this was uh, certainly a, a hot, hot day, August 2nd, 1975. And again, yeah. still, still the all-time record high for Providence. 
Okay, August of 1986. We'll stay in Rhode Island here. Um, this, again, was one of the more notable tornado outbreaks in southern New England. There were actually three tornadoes over the two days. Um, and this was the only multi-tornado day in the history of the state for being rec weather records being kept. Um, three tornadoes touched down over a 24-hour period. So the first one was in Cumberland. It was an F1, traveled about half a mile, damaged trees and power lines. The most uh, probably memorable one is the Cranston Providence F2 tornado. Uh, as you can see in the picture on the right there from the Providence Journal, um, traveled four miles, it flipped a truck, moved a house off its foundation, and took the top floor uh, off of the building there on the right. 20 people were injured mostly from flying debris. And then the next morning, uh, there was an F1 tornado in Burrowville, um, which traveled six miles toward, toward North Smithfield and damaged several cars, a building, and a trailer. Um, and you can see we actually have a web page uh, for this one if you go to that uh, web address weather.gov slash box and the 1986 underscore tornado. You should be able to look at a little more information um, from this outbreak in Rhode Island. And also, I believe um, there were several water spouts on Narragansett Bay this day as well. Um, but certainly the, the tornado, the F2 tornado in Cranston, Providence, uh, was the most uh, memorable of the three that day. So, Bryce, any comments on that one? Uh, no, really, somebody said, I remember that event, but that's about it. Yeah, okay. And just a couple more pictures here from our friend TJ Del Santo on the left. That was the building that had the damage uh, to the roof. Um, and they, on the right, an old grainy satellite picture. This was, Bryce, this was before you had to, you know, we had to use facsimile charts to get satellite uh, pictures. Oh my in. goodness. Uh, but you can, <laughs> if you squint your eyes and, and really close, you can see the storm over Rhode Island here where the cursor is. Uh, it's the storms blew up as they, that was at 4.30 p.m. All right, August 1972, three tornadoes in Massachusetts. And uh, the, one of them was an F1 in Wilbraham, uh, traveled a half mile and damaged to trees. The second was an F2 from Templeton to Winchenden, and that traveled 10 miles, downing trees and wires, and some damage to buildings with one injury. And I think probably the most notable of the three was, was the tornado from Needham through Newton and Brookline. It was an F1. Uh, traveled seven miles, damaging trees and some homes. Um, there was one fatality and six injuries in Chestnut Hill from falling debris. And I think if my friend Fred is on, I know he experienced this one firsthand. So um, I think he was coming back from the Red Sox game that day, uh, Bryce, and <laughs> just after this had happened. So he did not get hurt, but um, <laughs> saw the damage. Wow. So Fred, if you're on, you can throw some notes in the chat and we'll uh, we'll get back to that. Somebody right. just mentioned, sorry, real quick. Yep. Um, with back to the Rhode Island outbreak. Okay. Somebody said the Rhode Island outbreak probably no marine influence? Question mark. That's correct. Yeah, that's correct. Um, obviously, uh, there was probably more of a westerly wind that day. Um, that will be my guess because if you have the wind coming off the ocean, it tends to stabilize things and, and weaken the storms. So. Yeah. Yeah, this was probably and a westerly wind kind of day. Good observation. And then Fred, said, Fred. Fred said yes. <laughs> yeah. right. I know because we talked about this when uh, the social media post went out. So there you go. It was after the Red Sox game, so everybody was safe. Right. Okay, on to uh, August 1991, Hurricane Bob. And I know many of you probably remember this one. This was the last hurricane to make landfall in southern New England. So it's been a while. Uh, it made landfall on Block Island at 1.30 p.m., crossed over the Newport, and moved offshore south of Boston with a final landfall near Rockport, Maine. Um, this was the only hurricane to make landfall during the 1991 hurricane season. So I guess we were lucky or unlucky that year. Um, on the left, you can see the map of the, the track along with the rainfall. And um, if you've gone through our Tropical 101 series, you know that heaviest rainfall occurs along and west of the track. And this was a good example of that with the heaviest rain from uh, Eastern Connecticut through Central Mass and up into Southern New Hampshire and Maine. Um, you can see an example of the storm surge here from Falmouth. Uh, this was the house before the surge, and this was the house during the surge. So fairly substantial storm surge from Hurricane Bob. Some of the rainfall totals you can see here, uh, Foster, Rhode Island, just over seven inches, uh, a little over six inches out in Haverhill. The storm surge was uh, five to eight feet along the Rhode Island coast, but 12 to 15 feet on the upper end of Buzzards Bay. So. If you can see the track, obviously just west of Buzzards Bay, that's funneling all the water right up. And um, just the shape of the bay itself is 
uh, it helps really focus that storm surge. So that's really for us here in southern New England, that's almost a worst case scenario a track just to the west of Buzzards Bay or even Narragansett Bay is really going to funnel that storm surge up um, either when it caused quite a bit of flooding. Some of the highest wind gusts, Chatham at 115 miles an hour, Block Island 105, and up in Maine 92, there were 12 fatalities. Uh, the minimum pressure of landfall was 964 millibars and damage $1.5 billion in 1991 dollars. So just a few more Orange images. Yeah. Category two, correct? I believe that is the case, yes. That's right, yeah. So uh, again, Bryce, we're going to go back here. You can see an old radar composite <laughs> from Hurricane Bob. That yeah, that's old. Uh, but you can see, you know, again, with, with New England hurricanes, we don't have a nice, symmetric, you know, beautiful-looking storm. Everything goes on the north side, the heavy rain. The center's actually about here on the coast. It's all front-loaded, so there's not much behind it at all. Uh, and that's that's a good example. You can see the headline from the Vineyard Gazette there on the right, and some of the damage photos I was able to dig up um, here on the bottom. Boats were thrown inland, not a surprise, uh, but just a lot of damage, millions of dollars in damage from Hurricane Bob. Okay, Manchester, Connecticut, there was a, a pretty uh, destructive tornado back on September 6, 1973. Um, it was an F2 tornado with a path length of just over three miles, um, but it did strike, uh, you know, not as destructive as the Windsor Locks 1979 tornado, which we will get to, um, but it did cause damage to several homes. It struck Manchester, Vernon, and the Talcottville areas, uh, ripped off roofs of several homes, wall and roof off a garage, a cement block wall was blown outward, um, and numerous dwellings damaged by wind or fallen trees. Um, so this was back in 1973 in Connecticut, just south and east of I-84. Another notable hurricane, Gloria. This was in September of 1985. Uh, made landfall as a Category 1 hurricane um, near Long Island. And you can see on the track here, and again, where's the heaviest rainfall? It's, it's west of the track across the Mid-Atlantic and into parts of New England. Uh, so the maximum sustained winds uh, with Gloria were 145 miles per hour. This is before it, it made landfall. The maximum wind gust over land was up way up at Mount Washington, 127 miles per hour. Uh, the largest wave height offshore was about 47 feet. A storm surge of nearly seven feet at the Battery in, in Manhattan. And uh, in North Carolina, the greatest rainfall, 9.7 inches. Um, and this was another storm. I, growing up in the New York City area, I remember this one. Um, and we just missed the eye by a little bit. I was just west of the track. So, but I do remember Gloria. That was a, a pretty good storm. We had. No school for a couple of days, Bryce, because there were down trees and wires everywhere. Yeah, I can imagine. All right. And here's a couple, a few more pictures I was able to dig up. Uh, you could see some of the surf along the coast, a lot of down trees, wires, telephone poles, and uh, damage for the, mar the mariners as well, boats washed up ashore. Uh, this was pretty typical of what happened across much of the Northeast. Okay, on to the Windsor Locks tornado. Um, and again, this is probably the most damaging tornado in Connecticut. This was October 3rd of 1979. Um, it was an F4 tornado, killed three people and injured 500 um, in Windsor Locks. 100 homes were nearly leveled and uh, 30 aircraft destroyed at the Windsor Locks airport. Uh, again, this is one of the worst tornadoes in Connecticut history. It struck without warning. And given the unusual time of year, initial reports were of an explosion. and um, Actually, United Airlines flight aborted the landing as the pilot saw the tornado just in time. So certainly could have been worse. Um, again, for Bryce, an old satellite picture there on the right. Uh, you can see a little bit of enhancement here in the cloud tops. Uh, this is an infrared picture showing, you know, where the thunderstorms were. And one of the pictures, I've got a few more coming up uh, from the Windsor Locks Fire Department showing some of the damage in the area. Uh, again, a fall tornado. Uh, rare to have them. You know, we've seen them obviously a couple of years ago. We had a few, but um, you know, this was totally unexpected on this day uh, in, in early October. Um, just look at the weather map. Now, this was kind of the setup for it. Um, and this was from a paper um, written by Riley and Bozart back in 1987. Uh, low pressure was heading up from the New York City area into Connecticut. You had a warm front across Connecticut. And this is very favorable for our tornadoes here in southern New England. Um, you have the, the warm front, cool air, and the warm air kind of overriding it. You get 
uh, a lot of times a little bit of a spin. So it's these warm fronts we have to watch out for, uh, for tornado development. Here's a graph of the um, observations at Windsor Locks at Bradley. You can see um, uh, the dip, this is the barometric pressure, a sharp drop as the tornado passed over, uh, and a pretty rapid wind shift too, uh, going around from the east and then to the north and then to the southwest. Um, and these were the storm tops uh, taken from the radar, the nearest radar, which was out at Chatham. Um, and you can see the storm actually was headed north along with the warm front that day. So not the tops weren't tremendous, about 18,000 feet. That's pretty shallow, but um, enough that was able to produce a tornado that day. And here's a few more pictures. These are from the Windsor Locks Fire Department. Um, again, just devastating damage. This is an F4 tornado, and the damage certainly matches that. Um, you know, trees are flattened, uh, damage to buildings, damage to aircraft. Uh, so these are courtesy of the Windsor Locks Fire Department. Bryce, do we have any folks with memories of that one? No memories of this one so far. Okay. So in 1979, um, <laughs> it's the same year, um, a week later, we actually had the earliest measurable snowfall for parts of southern New England. And then less than two weeks later, record high temperatures were set at all the major climate sites. So uh, you can see temperatures in the 30s going up into the 80s in a matter of a couple of weeks. Um, on October 10th, even Boston had a trace of snow. Worcester, a record 7.5, and, and Hartford, a record 1.7. And then a couple of weeks later, we were basking in the 80s. So maybe history will repeat itself with our upcoming snow tonight. We can hope so. Yeah, hope so. And this was the uh, a little more on that storm, the early season winter storm. Uh, it still has the record for the earliest measurable snow in the Hartford area, believe it or not. And uh, there's the totals again we had before. Um, I couldn't find too much on this storm, actually. So um, I did find the Hartford Current had a few pictures, uh, but that was about it. So just an early season uh, winter storm uh, affecting the area from Virginia to southern New England. Then it's on to the perfect storm, the Halloween storm of 1991. Again, probably easily one of our top 10 storms here in the region. Uh, why is it called the perfect storm? Well, it was a, a rapidly developing low pressure system that had some energy from a uh, weakening hurricane and everything just kind of came together uh, to produce wind, storm surge. Uh, it also, this was the storm that the Andrea Gale went down in. Um, on the left, you can see the remains of uh, Sandy Beach and Situate. And on the right, a house was moved off its foundation in Situate. This is all from the coastal flooding. Um, peak wind of 78 miles per hour in Chatham, and that does make hurricane force. Um, a five-foot storm surge in Boston with a 14.3-foot storm tide. That's, that's pretty impressive. Uh, seas were about 30 feet at the Boston buoy, which is located just outside of Boston Harbor. Over 100 homes destroyed, and the lowest pressure, 28.70 inches. So... Um, again, this was one actually that was well forecast, and for those of you who have lived in the area for a long time, you may remember the name Walt Drag. Uh, Walt um, was on duty ahead of the storm and uh, did a great forecast. So um, this was actually a well-predicted storm. Perfect storm. Any Maybe. comments on that, Bryce? I have to say, you just said perfect storm. Somebody just mentioned the movie that was made about it, too. So. Yep, and that's, that's the exact same one, the Andrea Gale um, yep. out of Gloucester was lost in this storm. Somebody yeah. said it, somebody, I'm not sure, somebody said it, it even became its own hurricane in the center of the extra tropical storm, but they decided against naming it to avoid confusing people? Yeah, I believe that's actually true um, okay. because it was so late in the season, uh, they didn't want to cause confusion. It actually was developing tropical characteristics um, because huh. it was almost infusing energy from a different hurricane. Um, so, yeah, they, they, that's why it really didn't have a name and it became to known known as the perfect storm but um, okay. yeah there was some discussion about that um and that's you know something remind me bryce we'll, we'll get into that a little bit yeah. more to our top 10 uh from this. the uh and in fact you know we mentioned seas of 30 feet actually offshore uh the buoys were i think in the north atlantic were up closer to 60 feet and the story about the injury gale was that there was a rogue wave close to 100 feet. Um, hasn't been verified, but um, I, it would not, honestly, it wouldn't surprise me if you had to seize, you know, anyway, 80, 90, maybe there was a 100 foot rogue wave. Um, that's certainly, yeah. certainly possible. And that went out, that went out at Cape Ann. I think somebody said Cape Ann, on Cape Ann, this is also known as the no name storm. Right. So. Exactly. Yep. And I think we've got a few more images actually on, on the left here. 
Um, this was actually the surface map um, back in the in the day. We used to do hand maps all the time, um, and this was actually the surface map from October 30, 1991. You can see the low. It's you know fairly far offshore, but what we talk about wind, it's always the difference between low pressure and high pressure. So the old rule of thumb is um, you take the difference between the two. So 1044 to 983. Bryce, do some quick math. What do we got? 17 and 44. So that's what 61. <laughs> Yeah. And that's roughly what you can expect for a peak wind gust. Now, it did more than that, but at this point, that will be about the peak wind gust you can expect. So there you go, Bryce. When we start forecasting this winter, you can use that rule of thumb. I was going to say, I, I, was gonna say <laughs> I never heard that rule of thumb, but I remember that. Yeah, that's what that's what we say the old timers used to always use. And it's actually not bad as an estimate. So um, right. and folks want to play along at home, please feel free. So showing a few more damage pictures. Uh, these were from the Gloucester Times. Obviously, the Cape Ann was hard hit as well. I mean, damages to homes. Uh, you can see damages to roads uh, and coastal flooding as well. And I got some from the Vineyard Gazette. Thanks to them for sharing these as well. Um, this is uh, on the lower left is Oak Bluffs Harbor, if anyone's familiar with that. Uh, the water was coming up over onto the, the walkway. Uh, and again, this is, I believe, out over toward East Chop, uh, a lot of damage to homes there. Okay, getting into November, we're getting toward the end of, our, uh, of the calendar here. November 1987, an early season snowstorm. Uh, this was a storm that developed uh, in the Carolinas, moved offshore, but strengthened and brought wraparound snows to the region. And I think I have a little bit more on that. Yes, I do. Um, you can see widespread snowfall across uh, much of the eastern third of the country. There were actually two bands of snow developed um, as low pressure moved offshore. There was one band from western Massachusetts out into central Pennsylvania, kind of in this area, and a second one across southeast Massachusetts um, on the 11th and 12th. And then another one formed over the D.C. area, believe it or not, uh, which dumped 10 to 17 inches of snow on Veterans Day with uh, rates of 3 to 4 inches at times. So um, some of the snow totals you can see here, um, you know, approaching or just over a foot. Um, even Providence in Boston, 10 inches, that's that's not shabby. Um, Hingham, almost a foot, um, up to Ashburnham, about 15 inches of snow. So a widespread, heavy early season snowfall. Now, one of the other uh, ones we talked about was the December 1992 nor'easter. Um, and this really was one of the fiercest nor'easters to hit New England with, uh, from, especially from the coastal flooding um, standpoint. Uh, major coastal flooding with, um, and it didn't matter what state you were in, Connecticut, Rhode Island, Mass, um, severe beach erosion along the entire coastline, 200 homes damaged in Connecticut, uh, six homes were destroyed on Nantucket and one in Plymouth. And then in the interior, we had the snow with near blizzard conditions, drifts as high as 10 feet in the Berkshires, resulting in widespread power outages and tree damages. Schools there were closed for up to a week. Um, you can see the top was 48 inches at uh, Beckett, Savoy, and Peru out in the Berkshires, 32 in Worcester, which is very impressive. And for the winds, 78 miles an hour at Logan, 74 at Falmouth at Otis, uh, 54 at Worcester, 53 at Bridgeport, and 46 at TF Green. And again, for my friend Bryce, I'll show an old satellite picture, but um, it's an infrared shot. You can see the center of the storm and just a, almost a fire hose of moisture coming up around the center of the storm producing the heavier snows in the interior. So that was December 1992, still one of the top uh, coastal flood uh, events for Southern New England in 1992. Somebody, yep. Real, real quick, I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to just cut you off. No, go ahead. Just jumping back to the ice storm, somebody had an anecdote. They said they took a cross, cross Canada train trip starting late April, trees across Vermont and Quebec were devastated, particularly all the birches that lost their tops. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that damage, it took months uh, for, you know, uh, things to get back to normal. And obviously the tree damage stayed for much longer than that. So, yeah, yep. thank you. So here's a look at uh, just on, on a map of December 1992 uh, using the old fashioned contours. You can see a couple of pockets of heavier snow, one around Worcester, one in the Berkshires and even more impressive snow out in the Catskills, uh, three feet of snow out there. Uh, so this was this was a pretty impressive storm for December of 92. And here's an evolution. We were able to track down some of the maps. Um, seven in the morning, it's over uh, kind of the Delmarva region and uh, didn't move very much uh, really by afternoon and even evening. It's still just over 
off the almost the Delaware coast, but you could see just constant onshore flow. These are easterly winds out ahead of it, uh, bringing tons of moisture and there's enough cold air in the interior to result in snow. So that is it for our look at uh, part two, 70s to the 90s. Uh, and at this point, if anyone else has any questions or comments, um, we'd be happy to answer them. So send them in to Bryce. So one question, wasn't the December 1992 Nor'easter called the storm that would not die? I don't know, have you heard that? I haven't heard that, but um, it may very well have been because it was yeah. a long lived storm. <laughs> yeah, um, we'll take a note and then try and get back to you on that when we yep. do our top 10. But that was, yeah, it was, um, it was, as I mentioned, as I showed there, a very slow moving storm. Yep. Jonathan said, thank you guys. Great job again. Thanks, Jonathan. Glad you enjoyed it. Yeah. These, um, these are actually a lot of fun to put together going back to yeah. the archives. Richard said two days before the 92 storm, there was a lunar eclipse. Fun fact. Okay. Oh, okay. Cool. Fun fact. I mm -hmm. like that. Neat. Yep. And David said, when was the tornado that cut a wide swath from Springfield to east of Sturbridge? That, that would have been June of old? June one, twenty eleven. Oh, okay. That's, yeah. that's the twenty. That's the the twenty eleven tornado. Yes. So, uh, if you go to our YouTube channel, part one of our series has some information on that. Yeah. And then last comment, Ron said, "Great presentation." So, thank oh, you, great. Ron. Thank you. Well, we hope everybody okay. enjoyed oh, it. Wait, yep. somebody jumped. Somebody uh, jumped in real quick. Um, let's see. Somebody said that regarding the perfect storm, would such a storm be named using current criteria? Like, I guess if it was happening today, would, would that have been named, do you think? Uh, I'll say a definite maybe on that. And uh, <laughs> because yeah. well, we all remember with Sandy, um, you know, that was ex the expectation was it was going to become a regular nor'easter before it moved, you know, hit the New Jersey coast. Um, so as a result, you know, we made the decision, decision a few days before that we weren't going to have any hurricane watches or warnings. We were going to handle it with the high wind or coastal flood. So um, that's, a, yeah, I don't, I can't answer that either way. Um, it really would depend on our collaboration with the, uh, the National Hurricane Center to determine how they want to handle it. I think these days, having gone through Sandy and wanting to get the level and the messaging right, get the people's attention, we probably would go the tropical route. Um, you know, now we're allowed to do that. They call a storm kind of post-tropical and we can keep the, uh, like the tropical storm warnings going or the hurricane warnings going. Um, so yeah, it, it just would depend on our, our talking with the National Hurricane Center, how they want to handle it. But um, I could see, yes, we, we could handle it that way with, to get people's attention or, uh, you know, no, it's really what they would consider a regular kind of nor'easter type storm that we we wouldn't use a name for it but so that's a how's that for an answer yeah that works <laughs> I, think, I think that works somebody said will you go deeper into the april fool's day storm at a later date yeah that's um i possible. think you know i think we actually kind of missed that one as i was going through i realized it wasn't there um yes that will be we'll do that in our top 10 yeah definitely yeah. so a lot of these we just took from social media and took some of the bigger events um but yeah Somebody, somebody just mentioned they have a picture of damage from the October 7th storm on their street. That was an intense storm, they said. Yep, certainly no, was. And in fact, yeah, and, and jo please join us for the review of that. Um, that was actually one of the more high-end severe weather events we've had. We talked about 98 and 95. Uh, this was actually one of the more impressive uh, lines of storms we've had roll through. Um, and it was classified as a deratio, for those of you who might be familiar with that, just a long-lived uh, line of storms producing wind damage over multiple states. Uh, so we uh, we have that um, review scheduled. Yeah. And another question, it's more kind of a broader question that you'll probably have better insight than me. How much has winter storm forecasting changed from 1978 to today? Oh, a lot. Um, even from the early 90s when I when I started, um, the the computer models are much better. Um, obviously, you know. You can look at them online. We know we know days in advance that a storm is coming. It's very rare to have a, a, like a surprise storm anymore. Um, we have more observations now. We have um, a lot, just about every airport has an automated weather reporting system. Um, and back in the 70s, it was, it was limited. And in, in fact, um, here in New England, there were only um, 
three offices that provided weather observations 24 hours. It was Bradley, Boston, and Providence. So in the middle of the night, we had no idea what was going on across the rest of the region, where nowadays we have all the airports. Yeah, that is wild. Yeah, that was it. The other offices closed, so that was it. Um, obviously, we have improvements in satellite. Uh, the GO-16 that's up there now, we get five-minute imagery, one-minute imagery. Um, that's, that's been a game changer. Radar has been a game changer. Uh, we have Doppler radar now with what's called dual pole that can detect, help us detect precipitation type better. Um, back then, it was a, pretty much a manually run radar that just showed us where it was raining or snowing, and that was it. Um, and you know the computer, the computing power has been the big thing, and that's what's helped the numerical models. Um, we have what are called high resolution models now that um, can are much better with things like banding in the winter storms, where the heavy snow bands going to be. Uh, so a lot has changed. Um, I would say even just the past ten years for for forecasting winter storms. Definitely. Um, good question. And then this last one I see: When was the last blizzard in Massachusetts? You know, top of your head. That would have been uh, January of 2018, January 4th. Okay, 2018. Yeah. And oh, actually, another question. Uh, what are the ingredients for a major ice storm? Uh, for a major ice storm, so what we want to have is, um, first of all, you have to have a, a good source of almost tropical moisture or gulf moisture. Um, and then you want to have low-level cold air. So it has to be warm aloft, so a few thousand feet above the ground. It's got to be warm so the snowflakes melt. And then right at the ground level, you want it to be just below freezing. Um, so the rain, as it falls, it freezes and glazes into ice. Um, so in order to do that, you almost want to have high pressure um, somewhere either, you know, northern New England or southern Canada. And that's going to give you a feed of kind of cold air. Sometimes even dry air helps. Um, but you want to have some sort of northerly wind um, and then have at the same time, moisture coming up a few thousand feet above the ground from the south that's overrunning that cold air that causes the rain and then the, the below freezing air at the ground causes the ice um, it's most persistent in the interior say the connecticut valley the merrimack valley a lot of times um, because that cold air kind of gets locked in whereas closer to the coast um, the cold air is easier a little bit easier to erode um, even unless the winds really shift to the north and can lock it in a lot of times um, the ocean the milder ocean air comes into play. So um, again, it's really just a, a good source of moisture. You want a lot of moisture coming in, usually, you know, the, the Gulf or even the, um, the Caribbean. And then at the, at the right at the ground level, you have to have a, a, some source of cold air to kind of keep it just below freezing, maybe, you know, 30, 31 degrees, or it actually, you get more icing when you're obviously in the twenties and it's colder. Um, but you have to have that, that source of cold air coming in from the North really to lock that low level cold air in. So that's the quick recipe. Yeah. Um, somebody said, we're just wondering what the forecast is with Zeta for New England. Oh, for Zeta, well, rain and then snow. Um, so I actually, say, rain and snow. yeah, a little rain, it'll be rain continuing into tonight. And then uh, as the system tracks offshore, there's gonna be colder air drawn into the area tomorrow morning. Uh, and that will be causing a change to snow from North to South. So some of the hilly terrain, Worcester County out toward the Berkshires, uh, we'll have some snow, but even I think down into the Boston and even uh, northern Rhode Island uh, stands a chance at seeing, you know, an inch or two of snow, primarily on the grass. But uh, most of our models are showing actually a pretty good burst of snow tomorrow morning, um, starting about, oh, I guess, about seven or so, eight in the morning and till about yep. 10 or 11. So um, yep. certainly our advice will be, you know, pay attention. If you have to head out tomorrow morning, just leave a little bit of extra time. For the most part, the roads should just be wet. It's, you know, early enough in the season, but be careful. It's, if it snows hard enough, you can't get some slush on the roads. Um, back to the ice storms that we talked about. Somebody, Jason, wants to know, are ice storms more typical in early winter? Um, mo you know, the ones I showed were December, uh, but you can have them anytime. Um, you know, January, even f sometimes February it tends to be the, the atmosphere itself is colder, you know, in later January, February, but uh, under the right, you know, weather pattern, sure, it can happen almost any time during the winter. It just has to, again, have to have that source of moisture from the south and the cold air to the north. And then somebody says, somebody's got the perfect storm on the brain. Could Zeta combine with the winter storm and become a nor'easter? It's actually Zeta becoming a nor'easter, so it's not two different storms. Yeah, yeah, so... Um, 
most of the time, you know, as storms get this high, tropical storms get this far north, they tend to undergo a transformation to what we coming becoming like a regular nor'easter or a coastal storm. They go from having a warm core in the middle, tropical, to having a cold core in the middle, which is like a typical nor'easter. So that's actually what's happening. Zeta is undergoing that transition now. And uh, as it emerges from the coast, will be kind of like a regular coastal storm, a strong one, but but still just kind of a regular coastal storm. So it's lost its tropical characteristics at this point. Let me see. Sorry, let me just, I'm scrolling through here. Just um, didn't have, uh, oh, no, that's answered. Heard over, oh, somebody said I heard over 40 mile per hour gusts with the snow. Is that true? Well, as far as I know, the the strongest winds, 40 to 50 mile per hour gusts, would be on the Cape and Islands, where we're not really expecting um, much in the way of, of snow, more of a rain thing. We might see a few flakes, but uh, no, it's not going to be a, a really strong wind blown snow like 40 mile per hour, 40 miles per hour, where we actually have the the, the legitimate snow in the interior. Right. Um, so let's see. And that is it. Okay. Okay. Well. Uh, Bryce, and I want to thank everybody for joining us. If you um, want to provide any feedback or if you think of a question later, um, you can email me. My email address is on the screen or just use your um, confirmation from the webinar. And uh, feel free to send your questions or comments. We always love to hear from everybody. 